As much as I love breeding cichlids, I'm trying to hold myself to a rule. To avoid falling into a comfortable pattern where I would forget how to deal with species that reproduce in a much less organized fashion. Every once in a while I've decided I have to mix in some egg scatterers. These emperor tetras that I'll be showing you today are known, as far as tetras go, to be relatively easy to breed. For me, they'll be the last stop, I think, before I move on to something a bit more masochistic. I want to start off with some thoughts on sexing, which for this species should be no trouble at all. Let's look at females first and just notice a few things. The body shape, subtle coloration, length of the fins, and that greenish yellow eye color. Now if we look at a male, the contrast should be fairly obvious. They're much larger and more colorful on the body and the fins, and notice the bright yellow regions on those fins, which, while not entirely absent on a female, are hard to miss on a male. The thin black extension protruding from the center of the caudal fin also, while present on females, is much longer on a male. Lastly, look at the difference in eye color. Instead of the greenish yellow we saw on females, the eyes of a male are bright, almost luminescent blue. The differences between sexes are less pronounced at a young age, but the eye color and caudal fin extensions should be observable from well before a salable size. I've had this group for a while though, they're fairly well grown, and in preparation for breeding, I fed them a lot of high protein foods with brine shrimp being the staple. I used a small tank to actually spawn them, I think it's about 3 gallons, but really that's just to make it easier for me to film, so use what you have. One thing I like to do is give females some time to adjust to a new tank before getting harassed by a male, so I like to use a divider to keep him at bay for a while. The females I kept on the other side, along with some vegetation where they might like to spawn. I want them to feel comfortable in this area because as soon as I release that male, he's going to be pushing them in here anyway. After a couple of days, I pulled the divider and they started spawning almost immediately. Now you'll notice one female dart under cover, and that's for safety, not to spawn. These males are actually pretty aggressive about spawning and can easily put too much pressure on the females. The other female was more receptive and, as you can see, entered more deliberately along with the male. It's hard to see from out here, but they'll line themselves up side by side and simultaneously release eggs and milt. A single female will continue for a few rounds, but in my observation, they get tired of the pressure pretty quickly and will find a place to hide until the male calms down. That's largely why I've done this with more than one female at a time, to diffuse that aggressive attention and try to keep anyone from getting too stressed out. I've also tried using extra males as a distraction, but according to size and dominance, they'll quickly get forced into hiding along with any disinterested females. I'll share a few more details while we watch this. You can see I have the bottom covered with a thin layer of gravel. Now, egg scatterers, frankly, are not the smartest fish in the pond, and many of them will turn around and eat their own eggs if they find them. So, it can be helpful to have them spawn over some kind of a structure that makes those eggs harder to find. I didn't plan on moving the eggs somewhere else to hatch, and in that scenario, gravel has kind of become my preference. As far as water parameters, I've found emperors to be fairly undemanding. The water was about 77 degrees, with a pH in the high 7s, and what I'm finding to be a seasonally high mineral content. Out of curiosity, I tried using softer water, but I didn't notice any significant change in productivity. I let them spawn for as long as the females would tolerate, then removed all adults from the tank. What I observed next was very similar to my experience with ember tetras. The eggs seemed to hatch very quickly. No more than 24 hours later, I started to find fry dangling beneath the vegetation or clinging to the glass. Still undeveloped, mostly transparent, and stationary. Over the next several days, they continued to develop and eventually took on a posture that looked like they someday might consider moving. Most of them stayed close to the shelter of the vegetation, but there were a small number that would consistently hang out near the surface of the water, which I found odd. I wanted to take a bit more hands-off approach to raising these fry, so while they were still in their icicle phase, I started preparing the tank to feed them. I added a good number of paramecia, which if you're not familiar with would fall under the category of what we call infusoria. I'm a big fan of paramecium caudatum in particular because they're easy to see and easy to culture reliably. I had also previously added some dry leaves to the tank to start breaking down and act as a food source for even smaller organisms that the paramecia could live on for a while. I don't usually go this far, but like I mentioned, I really wanted to let the tank handle feeding for a while so that I could spend my time keeping cichlids from killing each other. I continued adding extra paramecia to the tank once or twice a week until the fry reached about this size here. 
This is well beyond the size where they could take larger foods, but I wanted to make sure any smaller fry that I hadn't seen yet would still have a chance to catch up before I switched to something larger. Once I felt comfortable that they were all at least to this size, I switched to feeding baby brine shrimp in small amounts two or three times a day. From that point, as usual, it's been pretty smooth sailing, just feeding, occasional water changes, and waiting for them to grow. The one factor I've found a bit difficult to deal with is their aggression. Males, females, even surprisingly young fry, they're pretty mean, and if any of them get a size advantage, they can really put the beat down on everybody else. In retrospect, I could have waited to amass a larger group of fry, and that would have helped diffuse the aggression, but you live and learn. This male in particular has gotten very aggressive recently, but on a more positive note, he can serve as an example of the size you might buy them at. He's about three months old, and as you can see, the sexual dimorphisms have already become pretty obvious. He was actually trying to breed with the females too, so I suspect that long grow-out periods won't be a major obstacle if you want to breed these yourself. So that's been my experience with Emperor Tetras. A little feisty, but not difficult to breed if you're so inclined. That'll be all for this one, so I'll see you next time to talk about Gold Laser Corydoras. Thanks for watching.